I started it as a palm tree and it turned into the crown of thorns and it's red and green and very abstract. It's mm. really, it's full of pain. Mm. But then I, I got carried away because I'd seen it in Marbella, so I brought some images of Marbella and then it's not right. And I thought, I know how to go on now. Mm. So I haven't touched it for three months. Yeah. And I can't wait. I, yeah. I know what I'm going to do. Yeah. Yeah. Just life is so short, isn't it? Because <laughs> the days come and go. Oh. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. May St. James the Great pray, pray for, for us. us. St. Catherine of Stenning pray, pray for, for us. St. Wilfred of York pray, pray for, for us. St. Richard of Chichester Pray for us. And Louina of Alphiston, pray for us. Our Lady Seat of Wisdom, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this third conference in our new series on tradition. And the question this evening is, tradition, who are we? So for the uh, last two conferences, uh, tradition one was, what is the church? And uh, last week was, how is it lived? Tradition, how is it lived? And this week tradition, who are we? Now you may recall, uh, uh, to summarise very briefly, um, uh, so we established at the beginning of these conferences uh, the nature of tradition, what tradition is, uh, what tradition does in terms of preserving and continuing uh, the faith, uh, that uh, sacred tradition goes hand in hand with the scriptures, indeed that it is from the scriptures, that the canon of scripture uh, uh, was solidified uh, by sacred tradition and how sacred tradition uh, encapsulates uh, basically the one holy catholic and apostolic church and faith and how we uh, last week we reflected on how we are uh, the living uh, we are the living tradition the living stones uh, so as it were we're sort of continuing on from that now the end of last week we had uh, a little bit of history uh, about uh, 
the ecclesiastical affiliation, uh, we might say, of this particular mission, and in general of uh, what old of uh, the history of old Roman Catholicism uh, up until the turn of the 20th century and its reception into orthodoxy, uh, and how and, and what the nature of uh, well, we didn't really get onto what the nature of orthodoxy is, but certainly we compared. Um, uh, the development and the differences between the East and the West uh, of the Church from the Great Schism uh, up until uh, the, the, the 20th century. Now tradition, uh, where are we? So it might seem an odd question, um, but be, tradition, where are we? Because of course uh, we are tradition, and by that I'm not meaning to uh, take to myself uh, the famous response of Pius the Ninth, uh, who, when questioned uh, during the First Vatican Council about tradition, said, "Tradition, I am tradition." <laughs> um, but uh, we are, of course, a living tradition. Uh, and one of the things I want to make clear, and strangely enough, um, it came up in a conversation today at lunchtime. Uh, and I corrected to someone to say, ah, oh, no, 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 it's not my orthodoxy. It's not my Catholic faith. It's not my interpretation of or understanding of. It is the orthodox Catholic faith. Because that really is the crux of the whole matter. The big difference between uh, the Catholic and Apostolic churches, those who claim to be the Catholic and Apostolic churches, over and against others... Uh, is that we maintain and profess that we have no faith uh, except what we have received. And uh, that when it comes to um, uh, interpretations and understandings of the faith, we refer to sacred tradition, refer to that which has always been believed everywhere and by all. So it's in no sense... Um, uh, my tradition, as it were, uh, as I've been very clear on other occasions to say, uh, if it's my opinion about something, I will tell you it's my opinion. Uh, if otherwise, assume it is the, uh, uh, it is fact, it is, it is the reality or the nature of, of the Orthodox Catholic uh, doctrine. Um, the very point is, although we respond individually, and of course then subjectively, uh, to the faith as it is received. Nonetheless, it is the faith that we receive uh, that we strive to conform and to uh, uh, bend our minds and submit uh, our wills to uh, adhere, to accept, to assent to. Um, of course, this doesn't rule out originality nor creativity. Indeed, look at sacred tradition and look at the masters within sacred tradition um, Greater minds the world hath not seen, uh, such as Ambrose of Milan or Augustine of Hippo or Thomas Aquinas or uh, Gregory Palamas or uh, all the others, St John Chrysostom, etc. Uh, all these were great minds and indeed in their turn uh, contributed to sacred tradition, contributed to it by their own witness and testimony and indeed by sharing their own understanding and insight and wisdom, but always in conformity, in consensus with that which had always been. It's only uh, when it comes to uh, the heresies, when it comes to uh, today, uh, that, uh, or certainly from 500 years ago, that suddenly everyone talks about their own personal interpretation and understanding. Um, for us, as Orthodox Catholics, um, we may have our own opinions, indeed. We may have our own thoughts. We may have our own sense and sensibilities, of course. Um, but uh, we profess and we adhere and we strive to assent to and to maintain, continue and preserve the faith that we have received, as we believe it has been received, uh, from the Apostles, ultimately from Jesus Christ, uh, when he was incarnate upon the earth. Now there are, of course, uh, various groups, we may say, uh, other ecclesiastical affiliations, 
uh, who subscribe and would claim uh, to be adherents to the uh, to sacred tradition um, and to manifest and live sacred tradition. And I want to kind of unpick uh, some of that uh, for us today, uh, in large part because uh, often uh, Western Orthodox or Old Roman Catholics are often confused uh, with uh, other expressions of uh, tradition, or Western tradition particularly. So that uh, anyone who has uh, watched the uh, developments in the Roman Catholic uh, Church uh, since the, well really since the turn of, uh, of the last century, but uh, particularly of course after Vatican II in the middle of the 60s, uh, will have noticed that there are all sorts of groups uh, claiming to maintain tradition. Uh, for example, there is uh, the, perhaps the most uh, famous or the most well-known or better known is the Society of St. Pius X, uh, otherwise known as Lefebvre's. Uh, they, of course, were the uh, uh, followers of uh, Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre, um, who had actually been a, a, a council father at Vatican II, um, but who soon realised what a mistake it all was, and who decided then to make a stand for tradition. Indeed, he was approached in the late 60s, early 70s, by various seminarians uh, who were keen to be formed for the sacred priesthood in the traditional way. So already at the end of the council in about 1965, um, the, uh, the you know things were changing. By 1967, uh, uh, the majority of masses uh, were being said facing the people, uh, something that wasn't even in the council, wasn't even uh, uh, described by the council, wasn't something that the council requested, uh, hadn't even been talked about, and yet people had taken this this kind of. Uh, air of change uh, and it had sort of become a life of its own and uh, certainly there seemed to be abroad uh, uh, in the uh, seminaries and in the universities um, a sort of newfound sense of uh, liberty or freedom to uh, uh, express and, um, and promote uh, what had previously uh, perhaps been left to uh, private discourses and uh, public lectures, all of a sudden uh, these um, innovative or novel ideas uh, were introduced and, uh, and practiced. Um, so sometimes I think we, we don't always appreciate the change that occurred uh, in the Roman Catholic Church uh, post-Vatican II. Pre-Vatican II, the Mass was always in Latin, it was always facing east, uh, it was always uh, sung, sung Masses, solemn pontifical Masses, um, uh, great pomp and circumstance in terms of the liturgy, um, and, and there were rubrics and, and everything was followed, and anyth everything was universal, it didn't matter where you went uh, to church across the world, in the Roman Catholic Church, it was always the same. You could, you could you know, a priest could, um, go from one place to another and say Mass and the service would serve in exactly the same way. Um, all of that changed after Vatican II. It shouldn't have, it wasn't supposed to, but it did. And such a change, um, it really was um, quite traumatic. Um, so that by the time of the uh, new missile promulgated in 1969 uh, by Paul VI, uh, where the whole Mass was in the vernacular, which would, again was not what the, the Council uh, wanted uh, nor discussed, but um, so, you know, there was a big change, big change. You had um, nuns whipping off their veils and taking up guitars and um, all sorts of uh, strange and wonderful things um, occurred. And of course, yet, of course, um, at the same time, there were a great number of people um, who couldn't see, who couldn't accept these changes. Some who couldn't see the need for the changes, and certainly many who didn't like the changes. Um, and these became known as traditionalists, traditionalist Catholics. 
as I say, some of these uh, uh, were seminarians who approached Marcel Lefebvre and uh, for uh, training, for formation, and so he uh, eventually uh, created a seminary, established a seminary, an icone, uh, in Switzerland, uh, and there uh, began training, forming uh, priests for the Roman Catholic Church in the traditional way, so as if Vatican II hadn't happened. And this was initially begun, it, it, it was um, founded in a cone because the local bishop uh, uh, supported it and gave it uh, his authority. Um, but this was um, relatively short-lived. Uh, the Vatican were not keen. Um, uh, there was great toing and froing uh, for uh, several uh, years uh, until things came to a head uh, in the 1980s, the late 1980s, when Marcel Lefebvre, realising uh, the fragility of his age, uh, knew that in order to continue uh, his work, uh, his effort to preserve tradition, uh, he would need to, there would need to be more bishops. And as a agreement with Rome couldn't be settled upon, and Rome wouldn't, uh, uh, in the, wouldn't, um, uh, what's the word, uh, wouldn't commit, uh, wouldn't promise uh, Archbishop Lefebvre that uh, they would uh, give a traditionalist bishop uh, to his society, he eventually uh, took the action to consecrate four new bishops himself. Uh, he wasn't alone in this, he was um, uh, assisted in this by uh, a bishop, Castro Mayor, from uh, Brazil, who would also preserve tradition in his diocese in Campos, um, which continued until uh, he died uh, not long after Marcel Lefebvre in 1991. Um, but the consecration of the four bishops, and I mean, it, went, it was right up to the end of the hour, um, Archbishop Lefebvre announced the date that he was going to consecrate these bishops. There was great toing and froing from uh, the Vatican, um, uh, all sorts of anecdotes, uh, one suggesting that a, a limo was sent from uh, St. Peter's to a home uh, to collect Marcel and take him to Rome if he would just sign the agreement. They would give him everything he wanted, blah, blah, blah. But he'd heard that so often that he just didn't trust them. And so he performed the consecrations of these bishops. That resulted in uh, his excommunication. Uh, and of course the excommunication of the four priests uh, whom he consecrated as bishops. Now subsequently, uh, uh, those excommunication, the excommunications of the four bishops uh, that he consecrated have been lifted. They were lifted by Benedict XVI um, just a few years ago, um, but uh, not posthumously for uh, Archbishop Lefebvre. Um, and variously, the, bish the society and the bishops have been in various talks with Rome uh, since the 80s uh, to find uh, some kind of reconciliation. But what prevents it all from happening, the sticking point, is that the society will not budge on tradition and the Vatican will not budge on insisting that uh, the society accept uh, the decrees and councils of uh, the Second Vatican Council. Uh, the society says it's full of errors, uh, it's not good, it's not consistent with sacred tradition, um, we can't go along with it, uh, and Rome uh, won't back down. There have all, there've been sort of um, uh, interesting, uh, gentle accommodations reached between the society and Rome, so and surprisingly by um, uh, Pope Francis, uh, who one would otherwise uh, suggest is not a lover of tradition, but uh, he has conceded faculties uh, during the Year of Mercy. He conceded faculties to uh, society priests to be able to hear people's confessions. Um, and he uh, later gave faculties too for society priests to um, celebrate marriages. Um, faculties means um, making them canonically legal. Uh, 
but the full regularization of the society has not yet occurred. And the language from Rome has variously changed. Um, originally, of course, uh, the Lefebvres were called schismatics, uh, even possibly heretics. Uh, now they're considered to be Roman Catholics, uh, but in an irregular situation. Um, uh, various times, several dicasteries in uh, Rome has uh, asserted differing, um, conflicting even, or contrasting uh, statements about the society, but it's safe to say that as of this moment, uh, the society is regarded as a uh, Catholic uh, society of priests. Um, again, strangely, uh, Pope Francis um, instigated this uh, in Argentina, where the society in Argentina, the government in Argentina, uh, had ruled that only those who were Roman Catholics could call themselves Catholic institutions. Um, the society appealed uh, to the uh, hierarchy in Argentina, and somehow or other it got to the attention of Pope Francis, and he ordered that the society in Argentina be considered Roman Catholic, uh, which meant that uh, the society could continue its chapels uh, and its seminary there um, uh, without uh, impediment from the government. So, rather bizarre, um, so the, the society of St. the X is both not in communion and in communion with uh, the Roman Catholic Church. Now, aside from the society of St. the X and the Lefebvres, a, another group of traditionalist Catholics, and so traditionalist Catholic is kind of an umbrella term for these groups, um, uh, are called or known as sede vacantists. Now the sede vacantists uh, believe that there hasn't been a valid Pope since the death of Pius XII. Their argument is that um, no Pope who espouses heresy can be legally Pope. Uh, and so therefore, uh, since John XXIII started the Vatican Council, and because of all the dramatic changes of the Vatican Council, uh, they hold that there has been no Bishop of Rome uh, since Pius XII died. Um, they too, otherwise, um, uh, would look and feel the same pretty much as ourselves and indeed the Society of St. Pius X. But the, the Sedivacantis and the society have nothing to do with each other uh, because the society, though it holds to traditional Catholicism, uh, recognises uh, the Pope as the Bishop of Rome. Uh, the Sedivacantis, of course, do not. Um, now there's a phrase in the canon of the Mass, uh, unicum famulo Papa Nostro, uh, which means in union with uh, our father. Our, uh, now, uh, Papa, of course, is, is where the derivation Pope as a word comes from. And uh, traditionally, uh, the chief pastor of the church so is normally the patriarch. So as we discussed before, you've got the patriarch of Rome for the west, and in the east you have the patriarchs of Jerusalem, Alexandria, Antioch, and Constantinople. Now, of course, there are more uh, of um, uh, Russia, notably, um, etc. And in that, so in, in that part of the canon of the Mass, to express communion with the Church, uh, you mention the name of the Patriarch. Um, so if you ever come ac across a uh, traditionalist Catholic priest, it's worth asking them this question. Uh, who do you mention or not mention in the canon of the Mass? Now, the Society of St. Pius X will do as any other Roman Catholic priest would do, uh, and that is they mention Pope Francis and they mention the local bishop. Uh, Sedificantists uh, omit uh, Unicum Famulo, so they don't say a name either of uh, the Pope of Rome, nor of the local Roman Catholic bishop, uh, but they will, uh, but they do insert the name of the bishop who 
uh, they report to. And then for us, Old Roman Catholics, Western Orthodox, uh, we, in Ulu Confabulo, we, we uh, mention the name of the reigning patriarch of Antioch, and some add the name of the Bishop of Rome. Now, that's because um, one of the reasons why uh, Orthodox Old Roman Catholics left the Utrecht Union of Old Catholic Churches uh, in 1910 was because uh, the Union had decided that they would drop all mention of the name of a patriarch uh, in the Canon of the Mass. And one Archbishop, uh, Arnold Harris Matthew, uh, knew his stuff, knew his theology, and knew tradition, and said, well, hold on a minute, you can't have that. You have to say you're in communion with a, a, a patriarch, you have to name a patriarch, uh, even if perhaps you may be in a regular situation or you may, uh, you know, you ought still to mention uh, the, the chief pastor, uh, the successor, as it were, of the apostles. Um, so when Orthodox Old Roman Catholics uh, left the Union of Utrecht, uh, Archbishop Matthew sought uh, a way uh, for Old Roman Catholic, Orthodox Old Roman Catholics to be able to uh, pray the Mass uh, in the historic and traditional way. Uh, so he reached out to uh, the Patriarch of Antioch and uh, later the Patriarch of... So from that moment on, uh, Orthodox Old Roman Catholic clergy mentioned the name of uh, the Patriarch of Antioch their chief pastor. Some, as I say, uh, add the name of the Bishop of Rome, which is more an, um, uh, an aspiration, as it were, uh, of uh, the sense of communion and union that the whole church uh, should have. You know, um, while we may dispute the nature of the papacy, how the papacy should behave, what its powers, etc., are, if what everyone is agreed, more or less universally, certainly uh, for the first millennium of the Church's existence, um, the consensus was that the Bishop of Rome uh, was first among equals. So he was first among the patriarchs. Um, so the uh, so we as Orthodox Old Roman Catholics. Um, uh, mention the Patriarch of Antioch and often mention uh, the Bishop of Rome as an, as an aspiration uh, for uh, the desire for unity, for reunion. Now, incidentally, of course, you may recall that, uh, bishop, that the Peter was the first Pope, first Bishop of Rome, but you may also recall that Peter I was Bishop in Antioch before he went to Rome. And that is why Archbishop Matthew turned to Antioch uh, basically the argument being, well, if we can't be in communion with Peter at Rome, then we'll be in communion with Peter at Antioch. And as Antioch was first anyway. Um, and that's why sort of my consecration as a bishop and at the, um, uh, and the consecration of our bishops, the mandate, the mandatum, uh, so which, which is the, the document that um, uh, proclaims uh, the Episcopal consecration, uh, in our uh, mandat, so in, in our uh, uh, proclamations, uh, it says that uh, the person being consecrated a bishop uh, is being done so for the sake of tradition, for the sake of um, the uh, uh, for the for the sake of the apostolic see of Peter at Rome, um, under the aegis of the apostolic sees of Saint Peter at Antioch and St. Mark at Alexandria. Um, now there are of course um, others who claim to be traditional Catholics and they come in all, all stripes and sizes um, and uh, but it's often easy to tell whether they actually are traditional Catholics or not um, uh, because often they don't know what tradition really is. 
uh, and so they, they trip themselves up. Um, bless them, they've often got half the story. Um, they often have a genuine uh, desire uh, to be traditionalists, um, but they just haven't had the formation, they just haven't got the knowledge, uh, they just don't know the wherewithal uh, to do it. Uh, and sadly, uh, they often have tried and failed or fallen out of um, actual traditional Catholic um, jurisdictions, uh, which uh, tends to give them then a bit of a reputation and they tend to become a bit bitter about it and all the rest of it. So, um, but one might say uh, for tradition, the living tradition of the church, uh, where are we today? Where, where are we, the living tradition church today? Uh, well, we of course would say, well, in orthodoxy. Um, so not just our little bit, not just uh, Western orthodoxy, not just orthodox old Roman Catholicism, but um, uh, the whole of Eastern orthodoxy. So the Russian orthodox, the Greek orthodox, uh, the Romanian orthodox, uh, the Bulgarian orthodox, uh, all the orthodox, um, we would say, are... Uh, living tradition and thus are the living church. Uh, we would also include uh, with that the um, what are sometimes called the Oriental Orthodox churches, um, uh, for example the Coptic Orthodox Church uh, or the Syrian uh, Orthodox Church. Uh, they're called Oriental because um, at one of the early councils uh, and it's suggested now that it was, you know, something was lost in translation, um, uh, but there was a, a sort of a fallout. Uh, but they have maintained, their histories go all the way back uh, to the first millennium. Then we might say um, that there are small, um, independent uh, pockets of tradition and the living church, meaning to say that there are um, small independent groups, meaning that they're, they're not connected uh, to the larger mainstream, as it were, um, uh, churches, uh, but who have retained uh, not only the faith, but have retained uh, valid sacraments. Um, so often these sorts of churches will be um, Sadly, sometimes through disputes again, where um, uh, a couple of bishops fell out and one said, right, well, I'm taking my toys and going over here. Um, but they otherwise have maintained uh, tradition. They've maintained the apostolic faith. They've maintained uh, uh, sacramental validity. And apostolic succession and the, sac and the, and the validity of sacraments, again, is, 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 a, is a very important mark, we might say, of the living church, of the living tradition of church. Um, all such churches uh, claim to have apostolic succession for their bishops going all the way back uh, to the first millennium. And what's key in that succession is that uh, the liturgy and the faith go hand in hand to manifest the intentions of the celebrants. So, uh, to, to give an illustration, we might take the ordination of uh, women as Anglican bishops. Maintain uh, that uh, by ordaining women, uh, those Anglican churches have uh, given up on tradition, they've broken tradition, they've forsaken tradition. And they would say because it takes, it's not just the fact that the matter of the sacrament is different, uh, but that the intention is clearly different. Now, why is intention important? Because um, traditionally the celebrant must always intend to do what the church has always intended by that action. So in other words, so when a bishop lays his hands on the head of a candidate uh, to intend to make them a priest, he must have that intention, he must have the understanding of what a priest is 
that the whole church has always had. And the liturgy, I heard, overheard somebody earlier talking about liturgy as symphony because a symphony of, of symbology, a symphony uh, of, of um, uh, traditions, uh, uh, etc. Um, the liturgy manifests the church's intention. So in, for example, the ordination of priests, traditionally uh, the chalice and pattern are held by the bishop and presented to the priest whose hands have just been newly consecrated for the new priest to touch the pattern and the chalice. Uh, and that act signifies that he is a priest uh, and has been ordained as a priest. You know, the church's intention is clear that with the presentation of a chalice and pattern is intended to offer the holy sacrifice of the mass. Um, so when uh, people start changing aspects uh, of the liturgy, uh, then that of course betrays a deliberate intention not to do what the church has always done. It must do. It must do, because otherwise why would you do it? Um, and of course what's why that's important is because what the hope what church what Christ what God does not want for us is any doubt as to the efficacy of the sacraments we receive you see you have a situation now I was reading something earlier on Facebook where there was a discussion, an honest discussion, somebody was saying, if I go on holiday, and uh, how do I know that the priest is a priest? So how do I know that he was ordained by a male bishop and not a woman bishop? And um, how do I know that, that he's orthodox, that he's conservative? Because there are still some conservatives left, bless them, in the Church of England. Um, and there are all sorts of, of answers given. Um, you know, well, f try and find out his date of ordination, uh, try and find out who ordained him, uh, etc. And but the thought that came across my mind was was the, the great sadness about all this is that this is never what God designed or intended for the church. We should have um, confidence when we receive the sacrament. We shouldn't be having doubts about it. We shouldn't be questioning it. Um, and so it's a great disservice. I mean, this is why it's, it's innovations like that are so destructive. Because effectively what's happened now for, you know, different pockets of the Church of England at present, but of course it will spread. Um, for the Conservatives in the Church of England who don't believe that women can be priests or bishops, they cannot accept that anyone who has been ordained by a woman therefore is a priest. And therefore that means they can't accept the sacraments from them. They can't uh, accept the Eucharist from them and believe that it is the body and blood of Christ. Um, they can't receive uh, absolution from them because they, they doubt that, that it's actually uh, uh, absolution. Uh, and gradually, so just in the, as in the same way that uh, we might say validity spreads by uh, the laying on of hands, um, uh, so too can um, the opposite, so too can invalidity. Um, and this is something that the Church of England has, has always been quite concerned about. Um, in the early 1930s, uh, they made an agreement with the Utrecht Union of uh, Old Catholic Churches, uh, and uh, Utrecht started to send bishops to Anglican uh, ordinations of bishops to try and give them the same validity uh, that they had. Um, and there are, again, all sorts of theories as to whether or not that can work. Uh, it's euphemistically known as the Dutch touch. Um, and sometimes uh, uh, Anglo-Catholic clergy will, um, uh, will have trace the lineage of the bishop who ordained them uh, uh, to see if he was one of the bishops that had the Dutch touch, um, which might make him valid. Um, 
Now, it sadly has to be said that um, for all the apostolic churches, um, even uh, the, the Dutch touch is not enough to give sacramental assurity, in part because of the way it was done. If uh, the Church of England bishop had been consecrated by the old Catholic bishop using the Tridentine uh, traditional uh, liturgy for the making of a bishop, then he, he would have been a bishop. But what they did was use the Anglican Book of Common Prayer service for the ordination of a bishop. And after all the Anglicans had done their rugby scrum uh, bit of, of lay hands on, you'll notice that uh, with, with the Catholics, it's done one at a time. Uh, the Anglicans <laughs> sort of just go on mass uh, and they even go hands on shoulders <laughs> as if it, you know, as if somehow the power will go from your hand to somebody else's shoulder down their arm to their hand or somebody else's shoulder down towards the person in the middle. Um, uh, so they, when the old Catholic bishops participated, the Anglicans did their rugby scrum bit and stood aside and then the old Catholic bishop came forward and said the prayers from the, um, the prayers of consecration of a bishop from uh, the Tridentine uh, Pontificale. But uh, we would say, and with many others, um, but that's not enough. That's not enough of validity. Because the rest of the liturgy is not declaring the intention of the church. Um, and even if you were to then give them a crozier and stick a mitre on their head, it still isn't enough because the whole context of the liturgy um, is wrong, it's not the same. Um, now there are you know, all sorts of um, theological opinions about that, um, and of course one of the most obvious questions uh, somebody, will, somebody thinking they're being original will say is, um, oh well, but um, you know, the apostles when they consecrate, when they ordained Matthias, they didn't have pointy hats and sticks and use chrism oil and Latin and all the prayers and all the rest of it. And that's, to some extent, that's true. But then again, they didn't need to. Everyone knew what they were doing. And they declared particularly what they were doing. But the point is, is that uh, the church has developed and grown organically. And she does what she does, and she's come to do what she does for specific reasons. And one of them, particularly when it comes to orders, is so that there is no question about the validity of what somebody is being ordained into and to do. Um, now this does of course pose um, uh, questions for um, traditional Catholics uh, when we go abroad or if we go on holiday, if we go visiting somewhere, where can we go? Um, and that's a good question and it's uh, a good question to ask um, your, your priest before you go um, and, and tell him where you're going and he might be able to see if there's a place for you to go. Um, but often these days, particularly in the West, uh, there often will not be a place uh, where you can go. If there is no Orthodox Catholic presence in the area you're going to, well then that's it. So uh, you'll just have to stay in your hotel room uh, and say appropriate prayers and, and the rosary or something instead, um, which often some will say is better than going to uh, a heretical form of worship, mm -hmm. where of course you may be in danger of hearing all sorts of nonsense that might uh, damage your faith or give you concern or doubt. Now of course, on the one hand, sometimes these sorts of discussions and things can sound a bit trivial. But on the other hand, of course, they're speaking to something uh, fundamentally important. That when you receive communion, you know that you are receiving the body and blood of Christ. That when you hear somebody preaching, you know that you are, here, you are receiving the faith of the apostles, the teaching of the apostles. And we can see in the last 500 years, particularly in the West since the Reformation, uh, 
uh, how ridiculous and out of hand things can become uh, when things go awry. Uh, and if you've heard uh, my homilies the last couple of days, um, uh, I mean, I've, I've pointed out, highlighted how and in what ways um, actually it's questionable uh, that those, uh, that many who call themselves Christians, uh, whether they actually are. Uh, in part because of their own personal um, practice in, in discipleship, but also, too, in terms of what they believe. Because if you don't believe, if you haven't got the one holy Catholic and apostolic faith, then you, it's questionable whether you've actually got the faith. If you've only got a bit of the faith, you haven't got the whole. It is very early on in the church's history uh, that the term Catholic was used to describe the faith of the church, meaning universal, but also meaning whole. And anyone who proclaims the Orthodox and Catholic faith means to say that they, they have the whole faith, they have the whole doctrine. Um, as I said to somebody else the other day, part of the problem with the Protestant Reformation was that the initial reformers knew the whole and were protesting or rejecting bits of it. But the next generation after them didn't know anything about the whole, they only knew the little bit that they were protesting. And they've continued to this day with only the little bit they were protesting, and now they're beginning to protest that uh, within themselves. So gradually it's all just dwindled um, and is dwindling into nothing. Um, and that's because they didn't have the whole. Um, so speaking of whole, um, it's close to supper time, uh, and uh, I'm sure we have holes in our bellies uh, that we need to fill um, to make ourselves whole, uh, just as much as we need the Eucharist, a valid uh, Eucharist, not a doubtful one, in order to make us whole Christians. Uh, and make us the living stones of the living tradition of the body of Christ that is the church on earth. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen.